wanted to fight. Do you live for conquest? Do you like limiting the rights of women? Then I have the game for you. Today we're looking at Divinity Dragon Commander. This is a game I have mixed feelings for, for as much as I want to like it, I don't. I do want to talk about it though, whether it's devotion to the review or just plain Stockholm Syndrome at this point. Anyways, what could be said about Dragon Commander? Well first I'd like to mention that despite the lack of polish and relatively short length with the game itself, it's not a completely bad game. It's clear that the game had ambition and the developers set out to create something unique, but limited time and resources got in the way. The mix of political sim, RTS, and board game with other smaller inclusions in the game itself makes it a title which few match. Dragon Commander was released in 2013 by Larian Studios, a Belgian video game company famous for their Divinity franchise and more recently Baldur's Gate 3. Around 2009 with the release of Divinity 2, Larian Studios was under some heavy issues as the company had been accruing debt and were largely in the red. After Divinity 2's troubled development cycle, two titles were being worked on, Dragon Commander and Original Sin. They were expected to give back what the company had lost and hopefully stay afloat. During development they had faced several setbacks, tough decisions, and the constant fear of near collapse of the entire company. At some point a decision was made to reallocate funds over from Dragon Commander to Original Sin. This left Dragon Commander on release cut short of what the developers set out to do, and in the end, Original Sin had been the standout success which allowed the continuation for the company. Dragon Commander, however, was murdered so others could live, and now we witness its exquisite corpse. The events of this spin-off are set within the Divinity Universe, but seem to predate anything major. The story here is after the great Emperor of Rivalon has been usurped by his children, these insane tyrants fight over control of the land. You, a bastard airborne of draconic heritage, must unite the Empire with the help of several races who put their faith onto you. You are the titular Dragon Commander, who aboard the airship the Raven must battle in war and politics to achieve greatness. Bastard no longer. You shall be known as Commander until the day comes that you shall be King. All hail the dragon. Hail. Hail. Yes, well, hail. Now, aboard the airship, you have several allies, each with their own reason for joining your cause. As the dragon commander, you have generals that will fight alongside you in several of your battles. You can't fight every battle yourself, and for a price, they do well to take on your burden. Some of your allies can provide various abilities and upgrades in order to better equip your troops and improve your dragon form. Additionally, we also have the Council. Commander, we really need to act on the misuse of necromantic magic. Our laws dictate she must hang within the span of two days, but Oberon is making a fuss and wants to extradite her. I'd like to raise a proposition about education, Commander. Commander, we all know that if an employer wants to fire an employee, he or she is given three weeks' notice. That is only reasonable. But Trinculo tells me the imps want to change this to three minutes' notice. Please tell him such an unfair change of procedure will not be tolerated. The worker is as responsible for the quality of his work as his superior is for the providing of wages and proper working conditions. If he doesn't live up to the bargain, then yes, one should be able to fire him on the spot. A grave injustice has been averted, Commander. Perhaps you may want to tell Trinculo he'll be the one exception to the rule, though, and that he has three minutes to evacuate ship. See how he likes it. Too bad. Responsibility breeds industry, Commander. Take it away and idleness is bred instead. The council members are representative of each race, with their own interests and needs that need to be deliberated upon. There's no right answer to please everyone, so just do what you want and regret accordingly. Later on, we have the option to wed a bride from one of these races in order to gain favor for that particular faction. It's an arranged political marriage, but those involved try to make the best of it. Each bride has an arc with their own character journey, but after that, not much else, especially in the endgame. The design docs for the game are really interesting, but indicate that much was left on the cutting room floor. When people describe this game similar to a visual novel and they mention that it has romance elements, I feel like it's pretty misleading as its scope is never that deep. Aside from the political sim, there's the RTS and board game sections of the game. 
Let's talk about the RTS. It's a honeymoon phase, where at first it's actually pretty fun to manage your troops and tear up as the dragon. Playing as the dragon overall is pretty unique and once fully upgraded is a one-man army of its own. You have pretty interesting abilities for both offensive and defensive use which can change the tide of battle. The dragon morph requires resources and a small timer to pass in order to use it, and your ability to manage troops and create buildings is severely limited while in this form. The cumbersome dragon control alongside some varying quality of maps can be a challenge. Units themselves are diverse and once upgraded aren't too shabby by themselves, each with their own set of advantages and disadvantages. Deeper while playing this game, the cracks start to show however. RTS battles consist of wiping out your enemy's base and acquiring resource points on the map. The game requires you to play super aggressively, practically zerg rushing your way towards victory. This limits actual strategy in your strategy game. The AI is also rather cheap, especially on higher difficulties. Depending on the act, enemies are already well equipped well before you are, and they really seem to have no cooldown in general. It means that certain segments of the game can have you flat out losing before you even start. The location and the troops you utilize change the map layout for the real time strategy segments of the game. Truthfully, the best map, however, is just the most straightforward one to defeat the enemy. Everything else is just attrition warfare, time after time again. Sometimes you need that dragon morph to give you better odds of survival, and the number of battles on the board per turn can leave you and your generals rather thin. Next we'll talk about the board game aspect of the game, and for the most part, it's a modified game of risk. Within the game's free acts, there are three different maps where you aim to control the board against your enemies. Here you'll place your armies across land and sea, make conquest or defend your strongholds, and gain gold and resource cards from the buildings on your land. One building per land, certain troops can cover greater distances, and at the end of each round you'll touch base with the raven. Various cards and money can be produced from buildings and also from your political decisions every couple of turns which can provide limited use items from extra troops, dragon abilities, research points, or something else that can give you an edge on the board. Research points helps upgrade your troops and your dragon, which is super important early game. You're fighting general odds here because unlocking units while your enemies have no such restriction is bork to say the least. Enemies can also use their own cards which can help them so you have to be aware and be well equipped to stand a chance. This gameplay loop is fun up until it isn't. It's like getting stuck in a game of Monopoly that goes on for far too long. Several battles can occur leaving you, your generals, or the auto battle to handle fights. This is fine, however, you're gonna get fucking frustrated. <laughs> The auto battle is tempting, but if you want to make real progress, you gotta use your dragon form wisely and participate. But this is hard because you can only handle one battle at a time. Other stuff is left for your generals or the auto battle. You can lose pretty decisively, and should you lose your capital and not have a backup save from a better point in the game, you're gonna be in for a really rough time. The deeper mechanics of the game are not explained that easily, even with the tutorials in game, so if you do plan on playing it, use a Steam Guide. Although each part of the game can have its fun moments, there's a certain point where you feel that you'd rather do another part of the game instead. This can be particularly grating when you don't want to battle, manage the board, or deal with the petty squabbles of the council. Dragon Commander isn't an outright terrible game at all, however, its moments of brilliance are tainted by the lack of polish. A unique blend and presentation cut short, a jack of all trades, master of none. Dragon Commander is an interesting game. The graphics hold up pretty well, and the soundtrack needs more recommendation. It's fantastic. But, can I recommend everything else? As is, it's a waitlist purchase. Thanks for watching the video. Like and subscribe. Stay tuned for more at Suppository Repository. This is MoopyBun signing out. And so it was that after long last, Sigurd's son, the prince they had called a bastard, became Emperor of Rivalon.